Welcome uh, to this luncheon panel uh, that has been organized by the litigation section and will address the future of federal preemption. Federal preemption, of course, is a recurring concern of the Supreme Court of the United States in a case is about a wide variety of economic regulations, including regulations of financial services, product safety, environmental protection, and the labeling of food and drugs. Our panel will discuss whether there is a discernible pattern in the decisions of the Supreme Court about preemption, whether, pardon me, and how recent changes in the membership of the Supreme Court will affect any pattern of those decisions, and whether there is a principled and coherent framework that the court should employ in this vital area of constitutional law. To discuss these matters, the Society has assembled a distinguished panel of experts. Each panelist will make an opening statement of eight to ten minutes. I will make sure they adhere to it. I will now introduce our first panelist and later will introduce the remaining panelists before each panelist speaks. Our first panelist is Dr. Michael Grieva the John Searle Scholar at the American Enterprise Institute. Dr. Grieva co-founded and from 1989 to 2000 directed the Center for Individual Rights, a public interest law firm. He has written extensively on many aspects of the American legal system and his publications include Real Federalism, Why It Matters, How It Could Happen. He is the co-author with Richard Epstein of Federal Preemption, States, Powers, National Interests. He is an adjunct professor at the Boston College, uh, has been since 2004. He holds a master's and PhD in government from Cornell, Uniform, uh, Cornell University and a diploma from the University of Hamburg, uh, Germany. Uh, please join me in welcoming Michael Grieva. Um, thank you, Judge. Uh, I'm very honored uh, to be here. I should, uh, I should have mentioned that he also once introduced me in the New York Times as being the key to the puzzle, and I'm still trying to figure out what that was about. <laughs> <laughs> in a quiet moment. Uh, I hope this works here with the technology. Uh, can we start? Uh, I, sh I should say, it, uh, thanks uh, for, for the invitation. I haven't done one of these uh, Federalist Society panels um, at, at an annual convention in a while. That's because I really never have any strong opinions about anything. <laughs> and so um, that, that makes it boring for everyone. But we've concluded I can still be trusted with empirics. And so that's what I'll do for 10 minutes, the empirics on federal preemption or some. Uh, much of this is based on a, an article I did a while ago uh, with uh, John Click, uh, which was published in the Supreme Court Economic Review. We've recently updated these, the, the, the data and added some sort of whistles and variables to what we collected earlier. I should say uh, that work was done principally by Mike Petrino, who's here, uh, who's uh, as of coming Monday of uh, Kirkland and Ellis. Uh, it's uh, no slight to him if I say that much of what comes now you have to take with uh, Jimmy Buffet's Lost Shaker of Salt. Uh, we haven't done much of the uh, analysis yet. You're dealing with a very small N. Uh, the coding is very, very difficult because you, I mean, uh, starting with the question of what is or is not a preemption case, it's not difficult because we can't read cases, but it's difficult because the justices themselves can't agree on that. Um, but I, I'm a believer in Richard Posner's position that in an information-free environment, even a questionable data point is valuable information. And so I'll, I'll give you a few data points. I hope they're useful, and, and we'll see what the panelists make of them. This is my first chart. Uh, it shows you the preemption votes by court. We've divided the Rehnquist court into two periods, the first Rehnquist court and the second Rehnquist court that follows a widely followed distinction originally made by Thomas Merrill in a celebrated article. Basically, the second Rehnquist Court starts after Justice Breyer's appointment. After that, the court remained in the same 
position. Uh, there, there are, you'll see some half cases. That's because some cases had split rulings. Uh, there's a total of 118 cases in this set, 58 for the first Rehnquist Court, 48 for the second Rehnquist Court, 12 so far for the Roberts Court. Uh, that works out to roughly four, four and a half cases per term. Uh, there are a few more in the first Rehnquist Court, but that re reflects by basically the miraculously shrinking docket. What this chart illustrates, they're broken down into unanimous cases, uh, cases with one or two dissents, and then contested cases, that is, cases with a vote differential of three or less. What this illustrates or suggests is a loss of unanimity on preemption questions on the court. Uh, if you look at the Rehnquist courts, over half of the opinions were unanimous. Only 20% roughly were contested. On the Roberts court, that is obviously different, although you have to remember the small number of cases there. My second chart, preemption votes by court. Uh, this is the outcome is binary. It's either pro-preemption or anti-preemption. Uh, you can't learn very much from this because there are too few Roberts Court cases, but I'll flag one question that bears watching, I think. If you look at the first Rehnquist Court and the second Rehnquist Court, the outcomes in these cases, pro anti preemption, were basically 50 50. And that's also true so far of the Roberts Court. Um, here's what's, what's different so far. Um, on the Rehnquist Court's preemption was somewhat more likely when the case was contested. And that hasn't held so far in the Roberts Court. There's only one contested case with a vote differential of three or less that came out in favor of preemption. That case is Waters versus Wachovia. All the other cases, if it's contested, uh, the pro-preemption people lose. Uh, we'll see whether that holds up. Uh, as I said, this is not a finding. This is something to watch. My third uh, point is, oops, can you go one back? Never mind, I'll skip that part. Uh, I'll go straightly to, to, uh, straight to this. This is the first of three charts on the uh, justices' votes. Uh, there we go. I'll do that one. Um, so, uh, the, I mean, the, the, the height of the graphs ref reflects the number of uh, cases uh, that the justices participated in, and then uh, the, the red bars indicate um, the, the number of times uh, they voted in uh, favor of preemption. Uh, the most pro-preemption justices on the Rehnquist courts were Justice Scalia and Justice Kennedy. Uh, Justices, Chief Justice Rehnquist and Justice O'Connor, not shown here, were, were very similar. At the other end of the spectrum are Justices Stevens, Ginsburg, and Breyer. Justice Souter, uh, also not shown here, is virtually identical to Justice Stevens. Uh, what has changed is that Justice, uh, Chief Justice Roberts and Justice Alito are much more pro-preemption than their predecessors. Uh, of course, Justice Alito's perfect record of 100% uh, pro-preemption votes won't hold up. But what will hold up, I think, is that Chief Justice Roberts and Justice Alito will be the anchor votes for the pro-preemption side if and when their percentages go down, as they will, it'll be in unanimous cases uh, that find no preemption. Uh, 